Hello everyone, welcome to Hometown Heroes, I'm Mike Kenichi, and today is part one of our interview with the voice of high school sports, the legendary coach, George DeMeo. And coach, I want to thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. And also joining us is coach's close and personal friend, <laughs> Wally. My little Wally. So coach, first off, thank you for coming on today. I mean, you've been a part of high school sports pretty much since you were in high school. Uh, <laughs> First question I want to ask you, though, I've never, you know, gotten an answer on it. How did you get the name The Coach? Okay. Um, when I took, uh, went for my interview at KC 101, right. I was wearing a jacket the morning I had an interview, and I had just uh, won the championship of Biddy Basketball. Coached a 10-year-old group of boys. We won the championship, and the sponsor bought us jackets. On my jacket, it said, Coach George. And they just looked at it and they said, gee, they said, if, uh, if, you, if you get the job here, uh, we'll call you the coach. And that's wow. how it stuck. That's interesting. And that's how it did it. Yep. Now, Coach, growing up, when would you say you first developed a love for sports? Would you, did you play Little League and Biddy Basketball? Little League, Biddy Basketball in West Haven. Right. Uh, started when I was uh, very young, did park rec, did anything that was possible for uh, back then basketball and baseball. So I... I played, you know, when I was a young young boy, right through Little League, Babe Ruth, right, and then played even some Barra Rizzuto, which was another league in New Haven, 16, 18 year old. So I played right through. I I love sports from, uh, and maybe because my dad uh, played uh, softball at the time, some fast right. softball when I first remember, and I went to all the games with him. And my uncle uh, was avid into sports too, lived next door, and. Uh, got me going but uh, i loved sports from the time i grew up right and you know when you were growing up too you know sports was really big in high school sports i mean you know you had a lot of teams that were very good and you had um a lot of football teams who were really starting to catch on you know mm -hmm. wilbur cross and hill house were very good you had ansonian derby their rivalry so i mean high school sports was really taken off in the late 50s early 60s um as a kid, were you a big fan of high school football, or did it take some time before no, you got I, it? No, I going to West Haven High School, which right. always loved its football. Uh, I was obviously I actually I actually played one year of football right. uh, at West Haven uh, as a sophomore, and uh, it just you know it, I didn't stick with it because I really loved basketball and baseball is actually my favorite right. my favorite sport, so I, I did play them. But no, I was I was a fan. Right through high school, loved it. Went to hockey games, uh, right. at West, which I had a big tradition at West Haven. Their rivalry with Hamden was even back then. Uh, the games at the uh, old New Haven Arena, which were just great on a Saturday night and whatever. Right. So I, I, I loved high school sports right throughout. Right. Now, you talk about going to West Haven High. Mm -hmm. If I'm not mistaken, you're around the same age as the legendary coach, Eddie McCarthy, from West Haven. Did you go to I'm, school I'm with a, Eddie? I'm a little younger than Eddie. No, right. <laughs> maybe by a year or two, yeah. But yeah. Uh, Ed was at Notre Dame. Right. And then I was at West Haven. Right. Did you know each other in grammar no. school, though? Mm -mm. No. So no. you'd never met. Actually, uh, and I should say, I actually went to Notre Dame. I graduated from West Haven. I went to Notre Dame of West Haven my freshman year then transferred to West Haven after that. Right, oh, so, okay. But I didn't know him, though. Right. But got to know him pretty well since. <laughs> right. So you, you you mentioned you went to Notre Dame your freshman year. Yes. Then you went back to West Haven your mm -hmm. sophomore year. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm not mistaken, you were very good in both sports, both baseball and basketball. And correct me if I'm wrong, weren't you the athlete of the year in 1966? I was. At right. West Haven High School, I, was, uh, I got that honor, and it was uh, – Certainly one I never, uh, you know, thought about. Did you think of yourself as a good athlete when you I were a kid? Was, I thought I was a pretty good athlete. I, uh, right. I love basketball. I was obviously I'm not a big guy, so I like to shoot the basketball. You know, a, a guard. But baseball, where you don't have to be real big to to be right. real good. Just uh, athletic, I, I yeah. was a pitcher all through a little league in Babe Ruth. I did some pitching in high school, but played mostly first base and played mostly uh, after that left field because we had we had some good teams at West Haven in baseball when I was there in the '60s. But right. yes, honored to be the athlete of the year in 66 right so talk about your basketball team in high school who who did you play for in high school what coach would I played for two different coaches my sophomore year at West Haven uh, I played for uh, Hank Fister who uh, 
was, was a teacher at the school, had coached for many years. He retired from coaching after my sophomore year. Right. Uh, there were other, there were candidates I know that came from a bound that wanted the job. They hired a gentleman from out of state to take over the team. I believe he came from Vermont. His name right. was Bernie Kuchar. Uh, he uh, certainly, and, and listen, he, he's a great guy. Right. He wasn't one of my favorite coaches, if, if I can say that. I so mean, nice guy, but not nice a guy, but I coach. he he didn't fit um, basically my cup of tea. I'm not sure he fit a lot of our team's cup of tea, right? Because he had his own special way. But um, don't know if he was well suited for the West Haven job. I can say that now because it's many years later. But uh, did he know his X's and O's? And no, you know, absolutely. So I played for him for the uh, last two years of uh, my basketball career. Right. You know, some schools coach, they're known for their football. Some are known for their basketball, some baseball, some wrestling, you know, hockey, whatever Mm -hmm. it might be. What was West Haven known for when you were in high school? I would have to say back then, a hockey program was very big. Artie Krauss was probably one of the legendary There weren't a lot of hockey teams then. No, Uh, no. West Haven, Hamden, Cross had a team back then. Hillhouse actually had a team uh, back then at the arena. And from this area, I believe Amity had a team. But... That's about it right. from this area. But hockey was was pretty big in West Haven, and I must say baseball was pretty big. I coached for the right. legendary uh, Whitey Purick, who right. won over 600 games, and uh, he, was, he was a great coach. He was, he was my all-time uh, favorite coach. Right. So now you mentioned you were a guard in basketball. Mm-hmm. Um, I like to shoot. When, <laughs> when did you see action in the varsity level? Was it middle of your sophomore year or more so junior year? No, sophomore year when I played for uh, Coach Fister, they basically back then with so many kids in West Haven being a big right. school, the JVs were really a separate unit from the varsity back then. So you guys didn't practice with them we, too No, much. rare. We, we scrimmaged the varsity a couple of times, and uh, the varsity had a very, very tough year. My sophomore year, I, I remember very well. Right. Uh, in fact, the JVs beat them a couple scrimmages, and that didn't make them very happy. But uh, we had a we had a good uh, JV team, but never really. It was rare when the JV coach said after the game, uh, "I want you to dress varsity tonight." Uh, it didn't happen back then. Right. So, um, did you enjoy that season though? Even though it wasn't the varsity, I enjoyed my sophomore year uh, under coach. It was. Uh, Hank Fister's assistant was uh, Mr. Raffone, who was uh, a teacher also in the building. Yes, right. I did. I did. So now your junior year, you obviously were seeing more action. You move up to the mm-hmm. varsity. Were you? Did you come off the bench? Did you start that year? Or? Believe it or not, my uh, my junior year, uh, I came mostly off the bench. My senior year, and I worked my butt off. I have to. I do remember those grueling days of preseason. Right. I started my senior year. Uh, generally started, but again, this coach had this tendency of he could start a different five every game. That's how he was. Right. But I did I did start uh, several games my senior year right. at West Haven. Yes. Now were you point guard or shooting guard? Uh, shooting guard. So uh, <laughs> any guys you kind of looked up to when you played, like you know whether it was college, the NBA. I mean, a lot of people loved Bob Cousy back then. Oh, yeah. in terms of pros, I was a, I'm a, still am a Boston Celtic fan right. in the NBA. So, yeah, growing up, liking him and Bill Sharman, and, of course, uh, loved those Celtic teams. But in our area back then, there was a, a young man a young man played by the name of Gary Liebertor. Gary Liebertor played for the University of New Haven, okay. who set every record possible uh, without the three-point line. If there was ever right. a three-point line when he played at New Haven, he would have broken, it still would be standing his People record. People don't realize that. I don't think the three-point came into effect till the 80s. Right. So, I mean, there are a lot of guys who probably, you know, missed scoring over 1,000 points in their career by just Correct. a little. And if they had the three-point line, they probably are well over it. He, he lit it up for you. I got to see him play. Uh, played for Coach uh, Porky Vieira at uh, New Haven. Right. And, uh, in fact, still talk to Gary Liebertor now, as a matter of fact. Wow. Uh, I've had him on my show, and uh, he covers a lot of high school football games. He's involved in coaching softball. So, yeah, he's he was one of the best. Back then, he was the player to watch in our area. You know, um, you mentioned the Celtics. Okay. I, I get jealous sometimes because the Celtics and the Yankees, two of my teams, 
they had phenomenal it runs. Might in the, also, yes. They had phenom phenomenal runs in the fifties, sixties, mm -hmm. and I always get jealous. My father got to see all that. I really didn't. Talk to me what it was like for you as a fan to watch those teams year in and year out win like they did. Especially you know the Celtics. They had Russell, who was unbelievable in that stretch. Russell Cousy, you know, Cousy. Bill Sharman, yeah, Tim Tommy Muscatoff Heinsen was even uh, over Tommy there. Tommy Heinsen, yep. who was just great. Um, at Willing Knowles for a while after he left right. after the Knicks came over and was great with Boston, but Casey Jones, Sam yes. Jones, I mean, you knew them all. Uh, when they just uh, throw their shirts out at the court at the Boston Garden, it was all over. It was just a matter of one red R back was going to light his cigar. Right back then, uh, it was great. And, and as for the Yankees, uh, my father, who is uh, uh, going strong today, even at 88 years old, wow. is God a diehard him, Yankee fan. And he used to tell me growing up, he'd say, listen, and there are only eight teams, obviously, in the major leagues and in the American League and, right. and the National uh, National League. And he, he said, there's only one team you got to worry about. Just worry about the New York Yankees, and we go from there. And uh, growing up with them and, and their players, uh, my idol growing up uh, was Mickey Mantle. There was nobody right. like number Everybody seven. Everybody loved Mickey. I loved yeah. Mickey Mantle. I, I didn't care what I heard even years later about him off the foot ever, because who knows what everybody else did as well. But on the field, uh, with, with a couple of good pair of knees, pair of legs, this guy could have been, and he was something special to begin with. But when he when he got out and put in that batter's box, it was on deck circle, it was, there was nothing like right. Mickey Mantle. I was in all. I actually got a chance to meet him later on when I got into radio. Oh, and really? He, yeah, I got a wow. chance to meet him at a... That's a dream. And it was a dream. And it was at the New Haven Coliseum, as a matter of fact, he was involved in a baseball card show and I was upstairs we we're doing a remote broadcast for KC 101 and I was just taking a break sitting down and there was a knock on the door and I opened up the door and I'm going he go can I can I come in here and say uh wow and I was I was flabbergasted then just to meet him we had a chance to sit down and talk for right. a few minutes I, I was just in awe still in Right, and I, I would be willing to bet you were probably 12 years old when that big chase was going on with him and Maris. I uh, was. Well, I was 12 right. years old, 1961, you're what right. Was, I mean, what was that like watching that all the time? Well, being a Mickey Mantle fan, I was rooting for Mantle, Mantle of course. Right. But Mantle got hurt late in the season and actually came out and said, I'm dropping out of the home run race. Right. Uh, Roger Maris, of course, I was so happy when uh, when he did it. Um, somebody did it. You know, To right. see somebody break a record that had been – in existence for many many years was something special right. and I can still remember uh, Phil Rizzuto's call on the air uh, yeah. when he hit it and uh, Roger Maris was not appreciated in New York at all he got treated unfairly unfairly by he, the press especially he was definitely a nice guy you could look at him Very and just say so. you know he's not he's actually somebody you should root for because Correct. I mean he played the game with respect and dignity. So he was he was all right, and I actually uh, had a chance to read his uh, did an autobiography uh, years later, which I read called Roger Maris at Bat, and it was it was something special, it really was. But yeah, but I mean with Scourin and Bauer and Barron yes, and Howard yeah. and Whitey Ford, who was another one of my next to Mickey Mantle, being that I pitched a lot in Little League and I'm left-handed, right. uh, and wore number sixteen my last year of Little League and. Or whatever. Uh, Whitey Ford, the chairman of the board, was my other idol uh, when it came to Yankee pitchers. Right, and I bet the Brooklyn Dodgers were very big as well. A lot of teams. The Dodgers them. and Giants, yes. Right, you know Giants. that's the other thing too. You get a little jealous about when you know. I don't ever regret growing up in this era, but God, I, <laughs> I always think God, I would have loved to see the Giants and Dodgers when they were in New York because New York baseball had to be something else back then. I can uh, remember going to Yankee Stadium. When I was oh, about the fourth grade, my father took me, and uh, I remember my mom going too, and she didn't go to a lot of games, but I believe it was the night they played the Cleveland Indians late in the year, and it was sold out. I mean, I don't even know if I could see that. My father had to keep picking me up, right. just because everyone was standing up. It was like 80,000 people that night, and it was something. It was just something else. Wow, that's Old crazy. State, yeah, it was. So now let's get to your baseball career now in high school. Um, you were definitely a very good baseball player. I love baseball. Um, what position did you play in high school? Left field. Right. Um, pitched on the JV team, but when I got to varsity, strictly left field. And we had a couple of brothers that played for us back then, the Garbatini brothers and people right. in the area know them, Neil and Augie, who were tremendous. When Neil, who played first base, pitched, then I came in from left field to play first base. 
Left right. field and first base were my primary positions, yes. Right. Now, um, how were your teams back then? Because you said West Haven was very good. I mean, you guys competed for... Oh, well, absolutely. Yeah. In baseball, we were... Uh, uh, my sophomore year, uh, we did very well. Again, played didn't play a lot of varsity my sophomore year. I got called up, though, uh, right. during the season. Uh, because, again, with all the kids, the JVs, we had a great season. Uh, my junior and senior years, uh, we did very well. We got knocked out in the state tournament... My senior year, we played the game at Naugatuck uh, and got beat 3-2, uh, to two, I believe, in the quarterfinals. Oh, wow. So it was one of those tough losses. But we had, we had some outstanding teams. Right. Now, your junior year, you, you strictly played every day, though. You were on uh, the field. I started. Right, yeah. right. I batted second. Second, wow. I batted second. Yeah. I batted second. Yeah. You know, I mean, West Haven's always had a rich tradition of great sports. I mean, yes. it's a great town, too. It is a great it town. It really is. I can. I moved back to my hometown two years ago, I'm happy to say. Right. Love going back you know, it's home. That's one thing I think, you know, because you don't, you're not one to talk about yourself that much, I've noticed on the game. So, <laughs> it, for years, I'll be honest with you, I always thought you were from East Haven. And then one day, I just remember you talking about being from West Haven. Mm -hmm. So. That's one of the, you know, tricks of being an announcer is you don't want to ever seem like you're biased. So unless you told somebody, nobody really knew where you went to high school unless they knew you. Right. Uh, my sons went to East Haven. I moved to East right. Haven and lived there for uh, 20 years, actually. Right. Uh, so they went to school at East Haven, played their sports at East right. Haven. And I believe your son, Jeffrey, won a state championship in baseball for so East So did Matt. Haven. They were on the same right, team. Right, both yep, teams. Yeah. Yep, they both 92, won the state. I believe. Uh, no, it was uh, Matthew won his, uh, he graduated in 89, he won 87. 87. 87, they won. Uh, Jeffrey was a freshman, but he was on the varsity team, and uh, Matt won it as a sophomore. They actually got back to the state championship game the next year, got beaten the championship game. Oh, right. Uh, but explain that, you know, I was going to get into that, but since we brought it up, Explain to me what the feeling was like to watch both of your sons win a state championship. It was uh, something I wished that I could have done. Right. Uh, you know, sometimes they say you live through your through your kids, and right. to watch them. And as I told them, I said, you know, I said, relish this moment of winning the state championship because, and I tell all the athletes today, you may never get back here again. Right. You know, uh, when you get that opportunity, it, it just. Take, embrace it, because to be here, even if you lose, the fact that you got here and all the other teams in the state didn't right. is, is something special. And they were fortunate enough to win it, uh, and I was very proud of, of East Haven. I was actually very proud of my boys. They actually uh, went on and had uh, pretty good careers at East Haven in baseball and basketball. Right. Now explain as a father, how nerve wracking the tournament was that year. Like, as you know, you're getting closer, you get by the first round, yep. then you get by the second, you still got to win three more games, but each game, you know, it had to be nerve wracking driving to those different ballparks. Watching. It was, it was, but the team they had, and again, my son, Matt was only a sophomore and, you know, didn't play all the time. Uh, and, and Jeff was just a freshman, but this, the team they had that year was a very, very special team. Right. Uh, they, they had some outstanding players. And I, I didn't worry. You don't worry quite as much. You worry a little bit more if your son's going to be out there starting or if your son is a pitcher. And I worried a little bit more right. in the next couple of years because uh, my son, my son Jeff, did a little pitching, not much. But they both started after that. And uh, you worry a little bit more then. But, uh, you know, you die with every pitch. You right. die when they're at bat. But uh, A lot of nail biting. Yeah, there's sure. a lot of nail biting. But it's all good stuff. Right. So now... You graduate from high school. You mm -hmm. go to Southern State University. Yep. You start the first radio station at that university. Correct. I believe you started in 1968, maybe? 68, yep. Yeah. So talk to me. When did you develop a love for announcing? When did you say, you know what, this is what I want to do someday? As much as you may not believe this, and maybe your audience won't, I actually developed it back in grade school. Really? Because when I used to go outside... And I had a big backyard where I lived in West Haven. Right. And I had a porch. I used to throw the ball against the porch and play simulated games. Right. But while I was playing the game, I announced it. Really? I actually announced it. I said, now batting, and I throw the ball against the wall, and it would be a ground ball. I'd say, ground ball, hit the short, you know. Right. Uh, McDougal up with it, maybe for the Yankees, throws the scour, and in time, you know. And I'd actually have a pad. I'd keep score. 
Wow. Yeah, I learned how to keep score for baseball games when I was seven years old. My father taught me how right. to keep it, and I've been keeping score for games ever since. But I actually knew I loved to announce back then, announced all the games, did it, did it through um, uh, when I got out uh, of college and then did some cable work before I actually got into radio. The cable, right. local cable access channel. Right. I actually did uh, some games on the cable access, some basketball games. I did some baseball games uh, and uh, did some announcing that. But in terms of college, uh, I actually was in the student union at Southern one day, just casually walking by. Right. And I went up to the window, a couple of gentlemen there that, that ran it, Mr. Remillard and Mr. Caliendo, can still remember them. And I said to him, gee, I said, Southern Connecticut was playing Central Connecticut back then. That who their, that's who their arch rival was back then when Central was right. in Division Two, And they were playing the last game. And I said, gee, is there any way that this game can be broadcast? Or is there a way we're gonna, we can hear it if you can't make it? They grabbed me. They said, oh, come right in here. And uh, they said, well, before we do that, we have to do this, that. Right. Next thing you know, I was the first president of the... Uh, Southern Connecticut, they, our first name was uh, the Southern Connecticut Radio Club. Right. And I had, um, we had a meeting set up with all the prospective guys and gals that wanted to be in radio. Wow, that's unbelievable. That's how it started. That's crazy. Now, was there anybody that you emulated that made you, you know, start announcing in your backyard and stuff like that? I know Mel Allen that's, was big You back just said then. it. That's what right. it was. He was a Yankee announcer at the time. Right. Uh, Mel Allen, Red Barber, yeah. uh, Jim Woods, but I was, not, Red Barber didn't like his, but Mel Allen, you know, when he got that excited and called home runs, yeah. he was he was unique. So he had a great voice. He had a great, and yeah. actually, once again, had a chance to meet him uh, wow. when I was in radio too, and got a chance to talk to him. He, he had his own style, and I think that's what you have to have. You have to have your own your own little niche, your own little style when, when you announce. And he, he was he was again my guy. Yeah, I mean, one there. of the best calls I ever hear. You know, obviously, I didn't see it, but they show highlights. Is when he always says conditions are. You know, fair today, but you could rest assured for these ball players, it's mighty hot. And I used, yeah, I used to love hearing that stuff. I mean, he just, you know, he he definitely he was the voice of baseball. He was. I think, and Vince Scully, of course, right. with the Dodgers. And Vince is he's still, still going, going strong, strong. and I mean, sounds just as good. Yeah, you wouldn't have a even... chance to listen to him on uh, on the MLB audio cuts, and he, he's great. Right now, okay. let me ask you this: Was there a part of you that would turn the sound down and announce the Yankee games when you got into it? I mean. I must admit, I, I did yeah. that. Yeah. I did that. And not only that, but I would always, if the Yanks were on TV, uh, I would keep score in my, in my book. Wow. For games on TV. In fact, my, my cousin to this day must, uh, did it, started doing it after I did it for all Mets games. I did it for the Yankee games. Wow. I always keep score. I used to love it. That's Love crazy. keeping score. Right. Now, radio and TV are, are a lot different. People don't realize. Radio, you have to paint the picture. That's correct. TV, you just have to make the call when the ball gets hit to left field or, you know, the quarterback throws the ball. Explain to me how challenging one is compared to the other. Oh, it's, it's, but see, yeah, it is. It, there's a, it's a completely different world. Uh, like you said, I love painting pictures. And remember, in radio, I can paint a picture as good or as bad as I want to make it. Uh, I can make the... Uh, error by a shortstop or uh, a bad shot by a guard or a bad pass can make it sound, right. you know, uh, or a penalty uh, or make that uh, the pass maybe what I call a folly floater, one of those you know, blue passes, or is it a tight spiral? You, you can paint any picture I want. Right. And that's the beauty of radio. And that's the thing that you've got to keep your audience. Right. You know, listening to you because if you're not if you're not painting good pictures or if you're not if you're not excited about what's going on on the field or on the diamond or on the court, then there's no reason for them to listen to you. Right, exactly. And it's funny you said about um, you can make the call any way you want on really? radio. I mean, John Sterling is as guilty as that as anybody because every time when I'm driving home and I listen to a Yankee game. And somebody hits a big home run, whether you know it was Jeter, A. Rod, whoever. Right. You know, he'd always say it is high, it is far, it is gone. Sometimes they were line drives that barely got out. Absolutely and, correct. You know, uh, I tried. I, I tried to at least say, listen, you know, this thing was gone. You know, just by the sound, you knew it was gone. Or if it just made it over, I, I will clarify that. Uh, but again, it can be it can be whatever you want. That that's the beauty of radio. That's probably why I love radio. Uh, 
more than more TV. So although, than TV. although as I say, I, I sometimes wish I've had a, had a chance to get into it. And I've had uh, people come up to me and uh, approach me, but uh, I just love radio. Right. Now, you had the radio station at Southern. Mm-hmm. Did you do any sports events? Did you guys ever get to take it to that level? Where Not one. Not one, Not really. One. Did you attempt to? or Every time I asked, it was... Right. So basically, you know, you're just a... You're we did, I did... I did do sports on my radio program, right. obviously, but uh, they basically, for the time I did it, uh, was a music right. music station. So you graduate from college, mm-hmm. and a lot of people don't know this either about you, is you were a successful social studies teacher, yes. correct? And I, believe, I hope so. And I believe you, did you teach at North Haven, was it? Or? East, I taught at, uh, I taught at Joseph Malillo Middle School, East Haven. Right, and you. I taught eighth grade. Right, and you also went to Connecticut School of Broadcasting. Yes. Right. So, you, did you have an idea? I mean, did you want to be a teacher first, announcer second? Did Correct. You, so that's what it was. Correct. Much. So I made up my mind. I wanted like, to be a teacher in fifth grade. Really. Fifth grade. I loved my fifth grade teacher. I wanted to be a teacher then. I never changed my mind right through high school and college. I someone asked me, I want to be a teacher. Right. And I never changed. Never changed. So you graduate from Southern, mm-hmm. and you get out of um, college. When did you say, you know what, I want to get into the broadcasting field? When did you go to Connecticut School of Broadcasting? I uh, went to the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. Wow. I have to think about that one for a minute. Uh, went in uh, just after uh, college, after uh, I was married. I got married right out of college. Right. And I was actually married with a couple of kids and decided I wanted to, you know, in, in the late 70s maybe. Right. And uh, actually, yeah, the late 70s. And uh, went to the school, Connecticut School of Broadcasting because uh, I'd heard about it and I knew it was, it was pretty good. But I can remember to this day, uh, my wife and I have been married a long, we've been married 46 years. Wow, congratulations. Uh, yeah, thank yeah. you. And she told me when I came out, she said uh, from, you know, you take a little interview and then you do a little read. She said, she, I know you're going to get, I know you're going to get, a, 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 I know they're going to take you in the school. I know it. I just know it. Right. I said, how do you know? She goes, I know it. And sure enough, they, they took me in the school. And I can remember the first night I ever went there. They, what they do is they give you a 60 second live commercial to read. Right. And they purposely make it hard with big words. It's a medical. Yeah. It's a medical uh, PSA. Right. And I remember getting the word encephalitis in it. Oh. Never forget it. And I think they were trying to trick you. And I, I ran right through it. And when I came out of the studio, the instructor said, are you a school teacher? And I said, matter of fact, I am. Actually, at the time, I was not a school teacher when I went there. I actually worked for uh, Southern Union Telephone Company right. back then. I got out of teaching, went to the phone company for 11 years. But I was. But he said, had you ever been a teacher? And I said, yeah. Right. And uh, so I went through, uh, what was it back then, like 13 weeks? Yeah, I, I know when I went, it was 16 weeks, yeah. Strictly so, nights. It was only a couple right, nights a week. Right. And to tell you the truth, uh, Mike, when I got out of there, I never envisioned getting, you hope you get a job, because they say they're going to place you. Right. But that's not that easy to do. And I really never pursued it afterwards. Right. I never really pursued it. And a lot of people it. do that. They don't get into it. They try it, and they don't. Right. I just never pursued it. Not that I didn't want to do it. I just never pursued it. Like uh, being married uh, with a couple of young couple of young boys, I, uh, you know, I had other obligations. But, again, had done back then when my kids eventually got into uh, high school, did some games on the cable uh, access channel, which I, I enjoyed. And it wasn't until uh, my buddy. My buddy, who is still my friend today, my buddy Ralph Soley, who gets takes all the credit for this, for right. me being in radio, that uh, called me one day when I was working at Southern Union Telephone Company in, uh, oh, 1980. I'd been there, 19... I think it was 1983, you went to case number right. one, right? And he said to me, he said, he worked in the East Haven school system as a custodian. He's listening listen to the radio every morning going in. He said, listen, I'm listening to Do- Dr. Chris Nose, who I never knew even who they were. Right. I didn't listen to the radio. Right. I didn't listen to the baseball game. I didn't listen to the radio. And he said, listen, they're looking. They just announced they're looking for a sportscaster. Do sports reports on the air. That, 
That's you, he said. I've been listening to you do these games. I listen to you all the time. He goes, you, right. you should apply. So I applied. And, you I know, KC101 was very new at the time. It was. I think they it had came changed in, what, formats. 1979? Right. It changed right. formats from an easy listening station to, to top 40 type station. And uh, by the time, so I said, well, what do I got to do? And he said, well, he said, they want you to submit a tape. So I said, all right. So I was working at Southern Union Telephone. I was working the, the night shift. I was working midnight to eight. Oh, wow. At yeah. the time. Uh in New Haven, and I went home one morning to do the tape, and of course back then there was the morning paper, the New Haven Journal Courier, I hate to date myself, but that's what it was, which was a great paper, by the way, uh, great sports section, and I had been up, and I had been reading it anyway, because I'm up all night, and I was doing right. the night shift, and you know, after I got out of work, got home, and I had a cassette tape, and I said, okay, and they wanted it to be a couple minutes, whatever it was, they gave me the guidelines, and I did it, and I listened to it, Right. and I said, sounds pretty good to me. And to be honest with you, and again, I, I, don't, I, I can't make this up, but I only did it once. Really? I only so did take. it once. <laughs> I did it once, and I said, because once I started erasing and going back, I did it once. It sounds pretty good to me. And that was it. No. Sent it into KC 101, and within the next few days, got a call from KC 101, and they said, uh, we're, you're one of the five finalists for the job. They were going to have five people, they pick five, and they said, your final interview will be a sports report on KC 101. Now, by this time, Dr. Chris Nose had gone to Detroit for another job. There was another morning man. Right. But uh, I said, okay. And they said, your day is Wednesday. Your day is Wednesday. So Wednesday morning you come in, in uh, North Haven, where the studios were, Come in after your shift, and uh, you'll go on the air then. And uh, wow. that's exactly what I did. And when I got there, as I say, I had my coach George jacket on. Yeah. They said if you get the job, the very first man I ever met in radio is still on, is still in, in the media today. He's in TV. He's on every weekend. Kevin Hogan from WFSB Channel Three was morning wow. news morning news anchor at KC One Hundred One, and I met him. Just a super guy. Uh, and what they said was, they said, uh, okay, coach, they said, you know, George, go into the other studio, get get ready, and we're, we'll call you in, and we'll give you the uh, time when you're going to do the final report. And I looked at him, and I said, well, I don't, I'm all set. And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, I already know what I'm going to say. Uh, right. You write it down? I said, no, I have it up here. Right. And so they said, wow, no, no one's done that. So I went on the air with no script, which is I do a lot of times to this right. day. I don't need right. it. Uh, but uh, did my sports report. And I, I thought it was a great experience, you know, just being on the radio, right. KC 101. Yeah. Uh, maybe it was a minute long, minute and a half I had forgotten. But I did my sports report, thanked everybody uh, for having me there. And this was Wednesday uh, morning. I got a call Wednesday night from the operations manager, Mike Scalzi, another super guy. Right. He said, George, I just want you to know that you have the job. That's unbelievable. Uh, it's, uh, so they didn't even wait a couple of days. That was it. Well, they, they had they had the two people come in Thursday and Friday. Anyway, they had to do that. Right. But they said, we basically are going to give you the job. And I started the Monday after Thanksgiving. I always remember when it was because the holiday was coming up. Monday after Thanksgiving in 1980. End of 83, because yeah, right. I remember being around. My first Super Bowl I talked about was the one in uh, 84. So, right. yeah, and that's 30-some-odd years later, I'm there. That's unbelievable. And you kind of had to alternate your your, your sleeping routine and stuff because you probably had to get up 4 o'clock in the morning back no, I was then. still working midnight. I didn't leave. That was only part-time. Oh, so I actually did. worked all night. And then went and to then the went station. And then went to KC-101. Yeah. You know, and the thing that was unique was – you were on a station that was FM radio, mm -hmm. and usually sports doesn't make it on Correct. FM radio. You don't have a sports guy giving updates. KC 101 kind of implemented that, especially when you got there. Right. And the other thing is, too, one of the things you learn when you're on, like, a morning show like that and you're giving reports is sometimes the, the DJs are going to kind of, like, you know, they're – they're partially serious. They're not. They're joking around and stuff. So, you know, your your report could get interrupted possibly. But that's one of the things I always noticed. And I always <laughs> go back to 
I remember when Glenn Beck and Vinnie Penn were on the air, and they yep. used to always ride Matt Fiduzzi, the poor guy. You know, they the did it man. right. They did it in good fun, but you would do your sports reports, and they wouldn't bother you at all. They would let you. Well, not not all the time. You're right. The the morning man that I worked with when I first started was Jay Stone. Right. Jay, basically, and again, no knock against Jay Stone. He was on the air. He didn't follow sports a lot. Right. So he couldn't interrupt me because he wouldn't know what to interrupt with. Right. Dr. Chris Nose came back from Detroit, didn't work out, and okay. they took him back. And I ended up working with him, maybe best people I've ever worked with. It was some of the right. best times of my life. And when I used to start do my high school sports, when I started implementing high school, yeah. Jose decided he was going to interrupt all the time. And I basically said to him one day after one of my reports, Dr. Chris knows, I said, listen, I respect you guys. They were talented guys. Dr. Chris was a super guy, uh, still is. Right. And I said, but I want you to respect what I do or I'm going to have to get physically violent with you. <laughs> and I basically threatened him. That's a true story. He'll tell really? you. Really? Yeah. Wow. I mean, to the point where I said, listen, you don't understand. This is fun for me. Right. I can go back to my job at Southern New England Telephone, not have a worry. You're, you're going to be in some pain. You won't be able to talk on the radio. And I went over <laughs> to the general manager of the station and told him what I did. I said, listen, just to let you know, here's what I did. And he started laughing. And I, was, I said, what are you laughing? He, goes, he said, because a lot of my salespeople and my people here are afraid of Dr. Chris and Jose. Really? I said, really? I'm not afraid. Afraid of what? And uh, I hate to tell you, from that time on, he came to... And he, I know he respected me anyway, and right. we're still dear friends today. Right. Uh, to the point where uh, we became best friends outside the station. Uh, he included me on a lot of his bonuses and rewards, which I never got right. in my contract because he had a big contract back then with KC101. And I must say he was just uh, to the point where I became legal guardian for his son until he was really? 21 years old, my wife and I, yes. Wow, you I mean, know. Just in case anything, he said, I want you to be my legal guardian. That's awesome. It is. And, and, you know. We became great friends. And, you know, Glenn and Pat, you know, basically took off when they became a team, as did Glenn and Vinny. Yep. But Dr. Chris really got that station off the Dr. ground. Dr. Chris knows yeah. we were, yeah. he was, he was the guy uh, in the state, especially in outside of New Haven, Danbury, Waterbury, a huge the guy in New Haven that I ended up working with and you said was big in New Haven it was Ron Romer. Okay. Ron Romer right. was was the man in New Haven. Now, here he is on a 5,000 watt AM station and kicking butt in the ratings against all the FM stations around. Right. And he did it for 35 years. Uh, and I had the pleasure of working with him uh, when he was on in mornings on ELI. And it was... was I worked with a lot of people, let's put it right. that way. <laughs> so basically... I think it was either the 84 or 85 season. KC 101 wanted you to start getting involved with the high school football. They were having you, you know, talk about games of the week and things like that. So they, they wanted you to go into a new direction with their station and really kind of cover the high school sports. Give new them, to me. Right. I'm the one who brought it up to them to have oh, them so consider. Oh, so you brought it up. I brought it up right. to have them consider uh, right. doing something, doing more local sports. Right. Uh, FM station, though, was a 50,000-watt station. The thing I had to get in my mind right. is that uh, it wasn't just West Haven, East Haven, New Haven. Now I had to think statewide for KC101, right. which was uh, an interesting experience. Uh, in the, and you, you were know, going to a lot of different oh, games I, back I, then. I started in the spring. I started in April of 1985 as my official. I actually did an, a year and a half of part-time, working two jobs. Right. I actually went to Dr. Chris at the time, and I said, listen, uh, physically, it's beating me up. I'm getting up early every morning. I've got to come in here and do my work. And then after going to work, I had switched to days then to another job. Right. Then run off, and I mean race to work. Uh, I said, I I'd like to go full time. And he was certainly instrumental, being it was his show, right. uh, in getting me a full time employment uh, with the radio station. And I can remember starting in the spring, and it was softball season, softball and baseball, and the very first game, it's, it's funny, I, I have a pretty good memory I, my wife, I, right. of, of things. <laughs> the very first game I traveled to, I mean, here I am saying, oh, you're not, you know, not in the area schools. I covered a girls' softball game in 
Brookfield. I said, I had never been to Brookfield. I didn't know right. the whole state like that. Well, I started learning pretty quick about Brookfield, Danbury, Waterbury, Bridgeport. I learned them all. That's how I started. And that's when I started covering girls' softball, boys' baseball in the spring of 85. And then from there, carry right into football. And the fall of 85 is when you started covering football. the football games. You know, you were doing all, you were going everywhere. Going all the games. And you right. weren't. You weren't at the time on the air no, yet not with the broadcast, games, no. but you were covering the different things. And you know one of the things that people loved that you did is you would get on the air Saturday mornings on KC Correct. 101, and you would go over the night, the games from the previous night. Your memory's good, and, Mike. Right. <laughs> and, and I'll never forget, you know, when Derby was playing Ansonia that day. See, that's the thing, too, is you were not a boring announcer. You knew how to kind of get the fan pumped up for the game. And I'll never forget, you're going over all the games that Saturday. You're going over this team playing that team. I think Seymour might have played uh, North Haven, whoever it was. Right. And then you finished it off going. And then, of course, the big rivalry in the Valley. It's Derby versus Ansonia. And you just get chills. I still get chills here. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, you it's, definitely, it, like, understood the rivalries yo, of, these, of well, these programs. The re and there's a reason for that, too, Ansonia Derby and Shelton and Derby, is because my wife is from Shelton. Really? Yeah. Wow. We met at Southern Connecticut, but she's a Shelton High grad. So I learned about Derby Shelton on Thanksgiving very, very quickly because uh, the best man in my wedding uh, is from Derby. Is it Nick Rizzio? It was Joe Borzelli. Joe Borzelli. Joe Borzelli, yeah. who ended up being my An best man. An outstanding softball coach. Outstanding softball coach. Yep. Coached a little basketball and girls, yep. too. And boys. And yeah. boys. Yeah. Uh, so Joe is, and uh, my very good friend, who I miss dearly, I lost him a couple of years ago, uh, Dennis Gleason, yes. who was from Aunt yeah. Sonia, who was an usher in my wedding. Really? Usher in my wedding. So all my buddies were from the Valley. Right. And then, of course, I met Brenda through these guys and right. uh, from Shelton. You know, it's funny you bring up Borzelli. You know, if you know him, I mean, I had him for a teacher, I had him for a Oh, coach. you did? Okay. Yes. You... He was one of the funniest people I've ever yes. talked to. He so smart, so quick. He had that dry sense of humor. Dry is a great yeah. way to put it. But talk about, like, he's underrated as a coach because he knows how to teach you, the, you know, basketball. He knows how to teach you softball. He just knows how to teach. Right. He's a great teacher. He got a teacher. bad rep, I think, as a coach at the time, uh, uh, maybe for – he you didn't know. win a state title and stuff. Oh, no, no. I, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. I, and I was thrilled. I right. was thrilled. Right. Because one of his assistant coaches, a dear friend of mine, Joe Muzanti, who was just one of the, best, one of the coach. best pitching coaches yes. I've ever met. Right. In fact, uh, till up to the last couple of years, I would send any girl that wanted to learn how to pitch to Joe yes, Muzanti. Yes, he was unbelievable. Yes, indeed he was. Yeah, and Borzelli, yeah, he was just a He was my best guy. man. So I that's... was best man in his wedding. He was best man in mine. Wow. See, something you learned. I never knew that. Yeah, yeah. We're great friends. Right. So let me ask you this, dealing with the different personalities in radio. I mean, <laughs> what was it? I mean, that station was really taken off. That station went from, you know, I, I compare that station to like WFAN because yep. in Connecticut, KC 101 to me is, they're the king of Connecticut, number one, as far as FM goes. I've always thought that. Yeah. I've and then, you know, that. if you talk about AM in New York, it's definitely WFAN. No question. So, I mean... A lot of people have to make it work and do a great job. Talk about why KC 101 has been so successful. Well, they actually try to appeal to most demographics. Uh, they, they've changed over the years, too, but I think they know what they can zero in on and what audience they need to get, and that's important right. uh, because, obviously, the ratings mean a whole lot in radio. You know that. It's a business like anything right. else, and uh, they, when they've needed to make changes over the years, they have. I think sometimes they made them maybe in haste, uh, right. but um, for the most part now with uh, on Case 1, even to this day, Elvis Duran in the morning is, right. is huge. Uh, and that huge. was something different they did. And that's different. Because they've always had a morning team. Correct. And they went in a different direction. Correct. They basically, you know, just carried his show, which, right. you know, was kind of shocking. Let me ask you this. Did you ever think when you saw him on the air, Glenn Beck would be as big as he is today? I mean, the guy is, <laughs> he's in a whole nother planet now right. on radio. Yes. He's, uh, look, look, look how successful he's become. I never really thought about that, Mike, to be right. honest with you. But I, I mean, I worked with Glenn Beck. Again, right. Glenn Beck. And he was respected not a big, your, He did, but he didn't. Yeah. He didn't know. He couldn't. Again, he didn't know. He didn't follow Anything sports about a lot. Sports, right. He was not a big sports guy. Pat maybe a little more so. Right. Uh, but uh, yeah, they they've uh, they took off pretty well. They've gotten pretty successful. So. Right. Yeah, and you Case One seems to. 
Push the, the right only, buttons. The only time, and I've always said this to people, is like I said, they would ride Matt Fiduzzi. I only remember Glenn ever interrupting you once, and you were talking about a Barry Manilow concert that yeah, your wife was going to, <laughs> and you were saying how you weren't going, and Glenn was like, wait a minute, you're not going to go with your wife to support that? <laughs> you know, and I'll never forget that story. Like, and Because I would always think that Beck wasn't in the studio when you were doing your sports oh, was, reports. Because, as close as you or me. Are. Because he never would interrupt you. You right, know, He no. had that respect. He was right across. You know, Dr. Chris, and, you know, you talk about Dr. Chris and Jose, how successful they were. And, you know, he's a dear friend of yours and things Mm -hmm. like that. You know, he left the radio station. It was kind of shocking that he got out of KC 101. How tough was that for you? Because he was your close friend. He was. When I, uh, I was actually, Dr. Chris, I think to this day, talked himself out of, talked himself into getting fired. Really? or, Or getting not renewed. Uh, yeah, and I don't know why because his ratings, his they, they his were worst his worst rate in my little while here, right. his worst <laughs> ratings. This is the God's honest truth back then. His worst ratings were better than anybody else's uh, in a good book. Right. Several years later, and I don't know why he did. I happen to be. It's funny because he was there. I was on vacation when he left. Right. So I heard about it. Because my buddy came up uh, on vacation with me and uh, joined me a few days later and brought the article with me in the paper. Right. And that was, that was tough. It was very tough on me because we were very close. Right. Now, is he still in radio or is he Believe retired? it or not, he uh, recently got a gig on the internet. It's a, it's a website called RadioBuzz101.com. Really? It's, it's a completely, I, I don't like it. It's an alternative type of music. It's. Right. Well, I, it's not my cup of tea. Right. But in between segments, Dr. Chris and Jose come on and sound as good as they ever did. Wow. And now, w- would you listen to the station when you weren't at work or like when you're driving or do you just tune radio? Do you now out? or then? Anytime. Like, no. You just tune radio out. Because they I, say I, a lot of people, a lot of radio people say when they're not at work or they're on vacation, they don't want to hear radio because they deal with that it is all correct. the time. And that's, that's how I, it's, I mean, do I listen to the radio uh, when I'm not there? Yeah. If I'm in the car. I always have it on or I put my, obviously my iTunes on or whatever. Right. But uh, I, I don't listen to the station per se. No. I never did even when I was a Casey 101. You know, right. But you know, I'm doing other things, but it's not a lot. Unless it's a ball game. Right. So now <laughs> we're going to get into it more in part two, but... As far as the high school coverage went, when did like you start to work at WELI? It was KC 101 sister station, but when did you start doing well, work for them? KC 101 and WAVZ right. were two stations together in North Haven. Right. ELI was in Hampton. Right. Uh, ELI bought KC 101 and AVZ, took them into the fold right. in uh, late 80s, like 90. 91, 92 maybe. in that right. era. Uh, and it was, you know, something I had not been through before. Right. Getting bought out and going to be working with other people. And uh, I had not done any. I had done limited games. I'd actually done a couple of games in 1990 with Paul Pacelli, who, again, still in radio today. Works for right. Fox, as a matter of fact. Okay. And uh, we had done some a bas- couple basketball games. Uh, in, in the process, did a football game together, I can remember. But we didn't have a set schedule back then. Right. And really never, you know, got into it. And it was after the merger that we started. But again, that was involving two stations. And if you'll remember, there was already a sportscaster there at WELI. Right. If we had taken them over, then I would have maybe called some shots. Right. Okay, but because they took us over, I couldn't step on the toes of, of the sportscaster. I didn't want it. it. was my good friend, actually, right. Bill Ganillo, the late Bill Ganillo, who is, again, we lost way too soon. Right. He was a sports director at WELI. We had worked together when I was at uh, Waves doing games then, and he, uh, we had you know talked about what games we were going to do even back then. When we got a chance to work together, we were both obviously thrilled to work together, but right. it was more his call back then. And now you you came to the station at 83. When did you, uh, if I know you, you were pushing for this every year till it happened. But how long did you push to get 
high school football games on the air every Friday night, wow. and also Saturday because you did a lot of those. I on did the Saturday games station. back then. Yeah, I did on yeah. ABC. We a lot of the, Hamden Hall games. Yes, yeah. Hamden. Yeah. Well, I did At those. Yale. Yeah, At, yep. You did college. Yep. Um, probably from the after I got full time, not when I was just there, you know, doing part time work. Right. But let's say. Uh, as my sons got older and got into high school and I saw how exciting the games were, right. it made me want to say, you know, we should be doing these on the air. So let's say late 80s. Late 80s. But um, really didn't. It didn't happen until what? 92. 92, 93, right. I have a highlight cassette tape that I still have, highlights of 1992 football games uh, that I did uh, back then. And my sons who were growing up and they were still in school actually did with me and for me back then. Right. I still have that. And you were also coaching Biddy basketball in East Haven. Yes, I remember, right. you know, you coached the Biddy All-Star team, you know, in 88, yep. 89, somewhere mm -hmm. around there. You know, one story I remember, Coach, and I was a young kid, but I'll never forget it. You guys came up to the Veterans Center in Derby to play Derby's All-Star team. Yep. They were 11-year-olds. I remember. And you saw Chris Gratidoria ref in the game. He was Derby's quarterback at the time. And I remember you went up to him and you said, listen, Make sure you ref a good game, or you'll never hear your name on the radio. Okay. Did I say that? Did you? Can you? Oh, I don't remember saying that. Although it's possible that you know, I said to him like, "I get every call." Remember that. Right. You know. <laughs> but I mean, that's the thing, coaches. Like even back then in the early '80s, late '80s, you were really starting to make your mark in radio. This yeah. high school stuff. I mean, not just football. I mean, every sport you were. Definitely... Well, I wanted to carry it through. Right. Right. I wanted to carry it so through. I mean, you're right. Basketball certainly was my winter sport back then. Right. And eventually got into hockey, but basketball then. And then, of course, I'd started girls softball right. uh, in the spring, and that's really where I started. But uh, when I first started covering the games for KC 101, uh, just a quick side, when I wasn't doing the game, before I did the games on the air, what they did is they started uh, greet the coach contest at the high school football games. I would announce what game I was going to on Friday night. Right. And my buddy, again, Ralph Soley, who was my dear friend, went to all the games with me. And what happened was we had a contest. Uh, people would make banners. Welcome, Coach DeMeo. Love Case. Thanks for you know right. coming. And I can remember, and they would come up to me at the game, and they would give me their banners. And I took all the banners back to the radio station. Wow. And Dr. Chris and I and Jose, we'd look at them all that Monday, and we'd actually give out a prize for the best banner welcome the coach to the high school football game really? i remember saving those banners for many many years oh yeah welcome because you know i wasn't doing them on the air right uh, but oh yeah that was the contest we did welcome the coach right now as much as you love sports was there ever a part of you that wanted to be a high school coach in any capacity <sighs> not then no 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 you i didn't get i didn't get into i had a lot going on i didn't right. want to get into coaching until and, and Want to get into coaching? I'm not sure I ever wanted to be a high school coach, but when my son got into coaching, certainly the thought crossed my mind of coaching with him, and that's that's when I coached high school. Wow, coach part one was so much fun, and <laughs> thank you. We've got more to come, folks, yeah. because we are going to hear all about the high school sports that coach and his crew did for the last 25 years, I believe, and that's coming up in part two. Until next time, I'm Mike Kanichi for Hometown Heroes saying good night, everyone.